So Ben, I, I hear you're hard at work editing our jury selection coverage in the in the hush money case. How's that going? You know, jury selection is super, super important and trying to uh, make it like compelling narrative for uh, <laughs> for the lay reader. You know, that's that takes editorial chops. What do you mean? What about juror number B7436? I yeah, mean, you know. Who might be an oncological nurse. <laughs> I will say that I thought it was very funny. I'm just, uh, I was not in New York. We are getting this from our fearless managing editor, Tyler McBrien, who attended jury selection. Um, according to Tyler and the poll reports, there appears to have been like an extended period Tuesday. When Trump had to sit there while Justice Merchan read out mean tweets that potential <laughs> jurors had sent about him um, because his Trump's lawyers were trying to get those potential jurors <laughs> struck. Um, and I will just say that sitting in court while a judge reads nasty tweets that other people sent about me. Um, such as an AI video of Trump saying, I'm an idiot, uh, with an <laughs> expletive in it. That's just, that's a nightmare right there. I mean, I look, I think, you know, this may be justice. <laughs> that he has to sit there and... Who and cares also, if he's convicted? He just has to sit there and listen to mean tweets about him. Right, exactly. He He gets to sit there, has to sit there, and... Uh, listen to what random New Yorkers have said about him. That's a special vision of hell. The other thing is that, like, he obviously used to tweet and now truths a lot, but he used it more as like a broadcast service. Like, he wouldn't engage or respond to other people's tweets about him. So someone pointed out, like, this may actually be the first time that he's seeing some of these posts making fun of him. Yeah, I also, I just want to say, like, we have a, a little bit of skin in this game, because one of the things that Trump has started doing recently is tweeting about lawfare. And, you know, I don't know why recently he's picked up the term lawfare. He uses it synonymously with election interference and other... Uh, but he describes, you know, a campaign of lawfare against him. And the other day, he retweeted Elon Musk talking about this being lawfare. And I just felt like the, the worlds were converging in a, in a good place that Trump and Elon Musk had gotten together to promote lawfare. And I hope lots of people had uh, Googled lawfare in response uh, and found the site. As long as we can fundraise off of it, right? Exactly. Hello, and welcome to Rational Security. I'm Alan Rosenstein, and I'm here with one of my regular co-hosts, Quinta Jurassic. Hello. Uh, our other fearless co-host, Scott Anderson, is still on still on parental leave, but uh, not to make too many promises. There's some uh, some birdies have told me he might be coming back sooner rather than later. So everyone, get excited for that. Uh, but in the meantime, we are delighted to have our uh, editor in chief, Rational Security guest emeritus Ben Wittes. Host Thanks Emeritus. Thanks for joining. Current host Emeritus. Guest. Current guest and host Emeritus, Ben Wittes. Hey. For what we are calling the Trump and Elon Both Love Lawfare edition. And I guess, and so should you, and donate to us. Um, to, this was, as, as usual, a busy week in national security news. So without further ado, let's talk about our three topics. The first one, Ayatollah and airstrikes. In retaliation for an Israeli strike that killed several high-ranking Iranian military officials in Syria... Over the weekend, Iran launched a wave of drone and missile attacks against Israel. The vast majority of these were shot down by Israel and its allies, including notably Jordan, causing minimal injuries and damage in Israel. As Israel considers whether to respond, its American and European allies are putting pressure on it to de-escalate. What's Israel's next move, and can a broader regional war be avoided? Topic 2. Beginning of the end or just the end of the beginning? It's been six months since Hamas's attack on October 7th and the start of Israel's war in Gaza, which appears to be entering a new, potentially lower-intensity phase. Israel has withdrawn most of its troops from southern Gaza, although it still argues that it needs to invade Rafah, on the border with Egypt, to defeat Hamas. Meanwhile, violence between Jewish settlers and Palestinians in the West Bank continues to increase. 
what's next in the ongoing conflict. And topic three, what's a little obstruction between friends? Earlier this week, the Supreme Court heard oral argument in Fisher versus United States, a case challenging the government's use of a common statute used to prosecute participants in the January 6th attack on the Capitol. The six conservative justices appeared skeptical of the government's argument that a statute that makes it a crime to obstruct any official proceeding applies to physical disruptions. How is the court likely to rule, and how might such a ruling affect Donald Trump's federal trial for trying to overthrow the 2020 election? For topic one, over to you, Quinta. In early April, Israel conducted a strike on the Iranian embassy in Damascus, Syria, that, as you mentioned, Alan killed a number of IRGC high-ups. Um, Iran had since then signaled that it was planning a response, um, and this Saturday we got one. So I believe over 300 in total uh, drones, cruise missiles, and ballistic missiles uh, flew from Iran toward Israel, targeted at Israeli military sites in the Golan Heights and the Negev Desert in the south. I believe so far there's only one potential casualty, which is a seven-year-old Bedouin girl in an unrecognized village in the Negev. Um, Since then, things have been at least not immediately explosive. According to Axios, Barack Ravid says that uh, Biden has said that the U.S. will not back um, any attack on Iran that Israel conducts. And so I think we're now kind of in a bit of a uh, holding pattern, uh, waiting to see whether this particular round of escalation is over or whether we're headed straight into a regional war slash World War Three. So, Ben... How how facetious should I be about this? How bad is the situation? Is this kind of a, a more or less expected tit for tat, or is it? Are we on the precipice of something really frightening? Well, I would say there's a lot of space between those two, and um, we are certainly in the space between a kind of routine tit for tat and a full blown war. And I think nobody quite knows where in it we are, but let's, let's back up a little bit and start with the exceedingly peculiar baseline common law rules of Iranian Israeli relations. So these are two countries that don't have any formal relations. They communicate almost entirely by attacking one another. But there are these kind of weird rules that both sides generally follow in how they attack one another. So, for example, in the common law of the Iranian-Israeli relations, it does not provoke a war for Iran to uh, engage in or sponsor major acts of terrorism against Israel or Jewish non-Israeli targets, like, for example, Argentinian Jewish community centers, right? These can kill very large numbers of people, and Israel does not respond by attacking Iran. Conversely, Israel can kill Iranian nuclear scientists and generals in covert actions over relatively long periods of time, and Iran yells about it and generally conducts terrorism in response to it, but it doesn't provoke a war with Israel, right? There's a third really important dimension, which is Iran has all these proxy forces, most importantly Hezbollah, but also the Houthis and the uh, to a lesser extent, Hamas and Islamic Jihad are, you know, operate with high degrees of Iranian support. Uh, and these are, uh, proxies are in constant combat with the Israelis. And that generally does not, Israel, the uh, proxies will attack Israel and the Israelis will respond against the proxies, but they generally don't produce or they they have never produced direct conflict between Israel and Iran. And so these are kind of the baseline common law rules of the relationship. And the Israelis uh, were very aggressive in that attack on Dam- in Damascus. It was an attack not just on Iranian generals, but on a major Isla- is- is- Iranian diplomatic facility. And it was a very direct attack. And while the Israelis did not acknowledge it, it wasn't exactly covert either. And so I think the Iranians 
perceived that as a major escalation, and they responded with a frank violation of the rules, which was a direct Iranian attack on the Israelis um, of a of a type that we've never seen before, and that is a it was a very large attack, um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of drones and and missiles, but it was also one that uh, the United States, the Israelis, and their various coalition partners were in a position to deal with in a quite dramatic display of air defense capabilities, both on the Israeli and American and French and British and Jordanian sides. And so, you know, I think this is an area in which, you know, there's an Israeli meme going around with a picture of a drone and it says, you know, first direct flights from Tehran since 1979, you know, um, I, look, you can interpret. It's at least a little funny. <laughs> it's very. I think it's quite funny. I, you can interpret this in many different ways. You can interpret it as a direct Iranian attack on the Israelis that the Israelis have no real choice but to respond to as such. You can also interpret it as a, you know, florid and amazing display of coalition uh, air defense capabilities that really serve to show that the Iranians have limited ability to get to the Israelis and that this was the Israelis, uh, this was a, you know, kind of take the win situation, which is what uh, Biden has urged. And I think the likelihood is that Israel will feel some need to respond, but it will be a response in the nature of trying to de a, a sort of minimal response in the nature of trying to de-escalate it, and the fact that we haven't seen it yet is a indication that they are not responding in a well, this is full scale war kind of way. So I, I'm curious, Ben, and we'll talk about the response, such as it is, in a second. But I want to stay on the Iranian attack first because it is amazing how effective the Israeli and kind of coalition response was effective just in the sense of shooting almost all of these missiles and drones down. And so I'm curious whether you think that Iran understood this, right? Because there are kind of two ways of interpreting the Iranian attack, which is they sent a lot of stuff into Israel and they wanted all those missiles to strike and very few did. And that's great for Israel. Or you can think they didn't actually want to attack Israel particularly effectively. So they sent a bunch of stuff to say that they did, but understanding that almost none of it was going to come through. And I'm curious which of those you think is more accurate and if it matters. Oh, I think it matters very much because, as I say, the only way these two parties have of communicating with each other is through military and covert engagements of this sort. And this is how they signal to each other. And so there is a large number of Iran analysts in Israel and in our intelligence community that are feverishly working to figure this out. What was, what is the signal that the Iranians were sending? I am unqualified to have an opinion about this. I feel quite qualified to- Dude, this is RATSEC, man. This isn't the regular Lawfare podcast. I'm just telling you, I feel very <laughs> qualified to opine about Israeli thinking about Iran, but almost completely unqualified to address the Iranian side of that equation. And I, I find it consistently mystifying and- I will say the Iranian delegation to the UN in the middle of the attack issued a very striking statement, which uh, I don't have in front of me, but basically says we have responded uh, decisively uh, against the Zionists. And uh, this is, we now consider this matter ended and the US should stay out. And, and and said also that they were exercising their right to self-defense under Article 51, which we should clarify, that's not what that is. Well, I mean, uh, look, the right of self-defense, their, their claim of Article 51 self-defense is not that different from what the U.S. claims when our people are struck and we respond, we make a very similar argument. But look, I think the fact that they said in there, 
we're done and this this exchange is over, I think was an attempt at signaling the Israelis that we're more in the department of, you know, sending a lot of ordnance over that we know you can shoot down because we have to be attacking you. But we're actually not trying to escalate this situation. And that was how I read it at the time. And I think, but I'm not sure that it is also how the the administration has read it, which may explain why Biden's posture seems to be, look, it's up to the Israelis whether to respond, but, you know, take the win, guys. I will say there's another side of this, which is, you know, you have this incredible display of U.S. capacity in the air defense arena. These are the same weapons that are being sent at the Ukrainians by the Russians, you know, these Shahed drones. And what we showed and the Israelis showed is that we can take down 100% of them. And, you know, that's really demoralizing to the Ukrainians. And I do think they have a, a legit question, why not us? This attack from Iran came at a time when Israel is facing pretty harsh, and I think it's fair to say at this point, increasing international condemnation for its conduct in the war in Gaza. And it is striking how dramatically the tone shifted during and after the attack from Iran. There were all of a sudden, instead of condemnations, there were all of these statements of, you know, our support for Israel from, you know, European countries, from the UK, and so on and so forth. Ben, I'm curious what you make of that. Is this are these warm and fuzzy feelings going to last? Um, and what does it mean for Netanyahu's government as it kind of navigates this situation? So they will certainly not last in the sense that the Israeli conduct in Gaza and in the West Bank has to be evaluated on its own merits, and the Israeli conduct uh, on its northern border and in its interactions with Iran has to be evaluated in their, on their own merits. And Israel, you know, mostly uh, countries do not have a big problem with Israel's posture toward the Iranian military, which is that Israel, you know, takes quite aggressive action to prevent missile transfers to Hezbollah, to prevent the Iranian nuclear program or to impede it, uh, and to get in the way of Iranian uh, aggressive action toward Israel, toward Gulf states, toward its other neighbors. And Iran is pretty universally, other than by the Russians, considered a bad actor. And so the, when, when the Israelis, you know, take out a, you know, a bunch of Iranian generals, there's some pro forma, uh, condemnation of that and a lot of secret, uh, glee or sometimes not so secret glee. Uh, in this case, there was a lot of consternation about it because of the fears of escalation. But there's not really, you know, there, there there are no Palestinians involved in this situation, right? It doesn't go to the sort of moral dimensions of Israeli politics. It's just Israel defending itself against a country that has a kind of annihilationist attitude toward Israel and has since 1979. And so there's a kind of alliance that's increasingly overt between Israel and the Gulf states and, uh, the, uh, and the moderate Arab states like Jordan and the United States and against Iran. And it, this is a very, uh, open demonstration of that so that, you know, in order to uh, send missiles to Israel, you, they do have to traverse Jordan. And the Jordanians actually have something to say about that. That's, you know, that's a violation of their sovereign airspace. They didn't give permission for that. And so, you know, I think, you know, it, people, uh, adults can hold multiple ideas in their minds at the same time. Uh, one is that they are they feel the way they feel, however that is, about Israeli operations in Gaza. But the second is that Israel has a right to defend itself against 
Iran and Israel's interests in its interactions with Iran are not very different from Saudi Arabia's or the UAE's or, uh, frankly, the United States, except that we have a lot less uh, skin in the game. So I want to talk more about Jordan, actually, um, from, from two different directions. One is what to make of the fact that Jordan apparently took out some of these drones and missiles coming from Iran and how significant that is. And the second is, and I guess maybe this is asking you to speculate about Iran's perspective here, Ben, which you, you said you didn't feel qualified to do. So feel free to beg out. But if you're Iran and you're sending all of these drones and missiles through you know, the airspace of Syria, Iraq, Jordan, I guess I can see Syria, Iraq, you might say, oh, they'll find, they're fine with it. We'll, we're not going to worry, or at least Syria. Do you just kind of expect that like Jordan and Iraq are going to be cool with it? Like what, what is, how does that play into their calculations here? Because Jordan clearly was not cool with it. Yeah. So Jordan, these are very different countries, right? So Syria and Iraq, Syria is a client state of Iran in, in, important respects. And uh, Iraq, of course, is heavily Iranian. There's a kind of uh, U.S.-Iranian power struggle that goes on through Iraqi politics. Uh, Iraq is uh, not in a position really to pick fights over its airspace at this point. Uh, The Gulf states, Jordan, uh, and a number of other countries uh, are, first of all, Sunni, and secondly, you know, moderate in their foreign policies, although what that, you know, moderation is a very squishy concept, but they're non-radical and they're anti-radical. And there is a long-term power struggle between the Sunni states and Iran for sort of regional dominance. Um Think of it as the UAE and and the Saudis versus the Iranians. And that's the the Jordanians are solidly on the side being a Sunni monarchy uh, that has uh, a lot of, you know, very close relationship with the United States that is against all of the region's radicalisms and is relatively liberal, although, you know, it is an authoritarian monarchy. It's, you know, it doesn't cut people's heads off. It doesn't, right, there's a lot that it doesn't do. And so in that, you know, Jordan is kind of point blank in the, you know, it also has a peace agreement with Israel that has survived, you know, since I think 1994. Um, And so, you know, if you think about the keeping multiple ideas in our heads at the same time, Jordan is a kind of good example of that, right? They they are very pro-Palestinian in Israel's relations with the West Bank and and Gaza, but they're not interested in being Iranian dominated, and they are interested in being having a military that is armed by the United States. And so from their point of view, this is a matter of defending their airspace. Yeah. So I, before we close out, I do, I do want to ask both of you this question. I mean, Ben, you alluded earlier to the idea that the Israelis may respond. And in fact, I think sort of reporting we're getting right now from, uh, I think actually the UK, uh, who you know, David Cameron's been talking to the Israelis suggests that, you know, he thinks at least that they'll respond in some way, but they'll respond in a limited way so they can close this out. What does that look like? Uh, ev- everyone wants to be the last person to to do the shove in a situation like this. Everyone so, wants you know, you, you can't Exactly. You can't, you can't control, you can't control whether, uh, as the Iranian said, this matter is closed. So what does this look like? So first of all, I think it means either a token strike against Iran itself or a a uh, strike directed at the proxies. Uh, Israel always reserves the right to hit the proxies, and it always has business with Hezbollah. But it means some kind of strike within the confines of the known rules, a sort of move back to within the rules. Now, I don't have access, obviously, to their target lists and uh, don't have a sense of what the what the options on the table were. But, you know, if if Bibi Netanyahu called me and said, I have to respond, 
I can't do a good BB impersonation, but he's a, I have to respond, but I want to respond in a way that's strongly going to signal de-escalation rather than escalation. I would say look for something outside of the sovereign territory of Iran that's clearly the Iranian proxy, not Iranian people, right? So not another seven generals, please. Um, don't hit a diplomatic facility and maybe something that everybody agrees is kosher for the Israelis to hit is Hezbollah missiles, missiles focused on infrastructure, not personnel. So you don't think this is the opportunity to go and destroy the nuclear facilities in Iran? Yeah, so this I think that's the, the prototype the of you. If you do that, it is a full scale war, right? And that would be like, if you want to take out the, you know, you want an Israel war against, against Iran over the missile program, that's a decision that the Israelis and the Iranians are going to have to make over the next few years. Um, but if you don't want that now, while you're still fighting in Gaza and you're trying to head off a war on the northern front against Hezbollah, which remember, Hezbollah is Israel's most capable military foe. And the Israelis have largely managed to not have that simmer along at an unpleasant rate, but not erupt in a full-scale war, you want to also do something that is not going to make that blow up in a serious way. So it's a, it's a very complicated problem, and one possible answer to it is to wait and not race to do anything, which, you know, we're now... F- three days into the week, this happened over the weekend, and there hasn't been anything dramatic. You know, that's the cautious side of Bibi Netanyahu. He he is, you know, we talk a lot about the things he does that are dangerous and aggressive, but there's also a very cautious side of him. You know, you may be seeing that now. Yeah, I think I think it was in Haaretz that there was some reporting that Netanyahu was the one saying that Israel should hold off and that uh, Benny Gantz was the one saying that they should counterattack, um, which is just a fun little bit of brain scrambling there for those of us watching from outside. Right, because these are not fundamentally left-right issues. These are a- a- everybody in Israel... Like you know, ninety-five percent of the Israeli population agrees that they're that you know the deterrence with Iran, the engagement with Iran is is not a political matter. It's just a matter of baseline uh, security, and it's not a it's not especially politically contested. The questions are all strategic and uh, and tactical, not moral or ethical or political in nature. Well, so let's let's move from Israel to more Israel, because um, it's one of those weeks. And, and I, I actually want to ask, uh, I was sort of debating whether to ask this question in the first segment, but I want to ask it in the second segment, which is, you know, before we talk about what's happening in Gaza right now, I'm curious for both of your thoughts on how, if at all, the the current conflict between Iran and Israel might affect either Israel's prosecution of the war with Gaza or how other countries respond to it. <laughs> I, I feel like going before Ben on this is like, a, it's like a pop quiz for something that I didn't study for. I mean, I look, I, I don't know. It does feel like it certainly drew attention away from Gaza um, and attention away from the people who are suffering in Gaza. And so, Perhaps you could argue, you know, in the sense of sort of international politics, that that's beneficial for the Israeli government in some sense. On the other hand, I mean, the IDF only has so many resources, and it does feel like if you're going to have to start worrying about, you know, routine attacks coming in from from Iran, and perhaps, uh, you know, something uh, cooked up from Hezbollah or more attacks from the Houthis in the south, that then that is going to take resources away from whatever the IDF is planning in in Gaza. On the other hand, as we're going to discuss, the uh, IDF has largely withdrawn from southern Gaza. So basically what I'm saying is that I don't know. Ben, help me out here. 
So I, I really think this this is something that proceeds on two concurrent tracks and people, you know, other than like the people who hate Israel. And there are a lot of those people. Just about everybody else understands that it is possible to criticize Israel on one front and defend it on another. And there's no, I, I like, I don't actually think that idea is very hard. And so uh, there's lots of things that Israel does that are great. And there are things that Israel does that are really upsetting and that we object to. And, and so I think the, the fact that, you know, lots of European countries can cheer when the Israelis and frankly, the Americans, this was a lot of this was our personnel and, um, you know, uh, take out a whole bunch of Iranian drones. That's not a morally complicated set of ideas. And so, and I don't think it will relieve pressure in any, and by the way, it shouldn't relieve pressure in any significant respect on the Israelis with respect to Gaza. The thing that could relieve pressure on Israel with respect to Gaza and should is, number one, a improvement of the humanitarian aid delivery situation. Number two, evidence of that there is a serious uh, set of discussions about what happens after uh, you oust Hamas, if that's if that remains the military objective. And number three, evidence that that is being pursued in a fashion that is systemically sensitive to uh, civilian life and well-being. And I, I think as long as those three conditions are chronically in dispute and we get daily evidence that leads reasonable people to worry that those are not the case, um, Israel will continue to get significant criticism. And I don't think the fact that they achieve significant things in other areas will protect them for it. And by the way, I don't think it should. Any more than it protects the United States to say, wow, you know, we're, we, we're, we accomplish great things in areas A, B, and C, and uh, we can't pass the Ukraine package in a timely way, alleviates criticism of us for not being able to pass the Ukraine package. Right? I mean, like, countries are complicated. There's. Can I add one, one thing to that, which, Ben, tell me if I'm totally wrong here, but I think you can also take that same observation when in thinking about Iran's actions as well. And here I'm mostly subtweeting a bunch of US leftists, but just because my favorite version of Quinta. just because Iran is attacking Israel does not mean that the Iranian government actually cares about the situation of Palestinians who are trapped and starving in Gaza, right? Like you can divorce those two things. There is not a shred of evidence that, you know, the one Israeli casualty of this Iranian attack is a young Palestinian uh, girl. Uh, we call the Israeli term for uh, this community. They use the term Bedouin, but let's say in international parlance, this uh, person would be called a Palestinian, a Palestinian citizen of Israel. Uh, and um, like so many uh, people in Bedouin communities uh, who have been victims of uh, Hamas, who have, you know, these are people who, you know, in their solicitude for the plight of the Palestinian people, the Iranians have really not troubled themselves at all to avoid killing. All right. So, so let's move away from Iran, talk about the situation sort of more in Gaza proper. It seems to be you have some sort of cross-cutting currents here, right? On the one hand, you have this drawdown in southern Gaza, which suggests that, again, the Israeli military operation is, is at least slowing down, at least for the time being. On the other hand, you have repeated, you know, arguments from Benjamin and Yah and others in the Israeli government that they still need to go and attack Rafah because that's what they need to, you know, destroy Hamas. Meanwhile, the parts of Gaza that you know Israel already went through 
is having to go back in some cases. So, for example, in March, Israel went back into Gaza City to attack Hamas fighters who had returned to the Al Shifa hospital. And then, of course, there's also a set of negotiations that are theoretically going on between Hamas and Israel about hostage release, and it's not clear how those are going. Um, you know, Hamas at some point recently said that it can't find 40 Israeli hostages with which to actually even do a first round of transfers, which does not bode well for the, I think, 137 hostages that are presumed to still be in Gaza. And it's pretty clear that some of those hostages are just no longer alive. And so um, the whole, in some sense, one of the main purposes of the Israeli counter or the Israeli sort of uh, attack on Hamas is to get the hostages back. It's not clear that anything, any of that's going to work because uh, there might not be any hostages left. And we haven't even talked about the, the West Bank situation. And we'll just kind of put that to a side. So, I mean, I just confused myself uh, in describing this this set of events. B- ben, where, where are you? Are you confused? Well, I'm I'm honestly confused in exactly the way I expected to be at the beginning of the conflict, which is that the Israelis set out two goals that are entirely in conflict with one another, uh, which was the destruction of Hamas, at least as a governing force, and the freedom of the hostages. And obviously, if you're uh, committed to the first goal, the consequence of that is that, you know, you're going to lose a lot of the hostages. But and that it, was obvious, right? I mean, I always assumed that Israel had essentially written off the hostages. Right, which turns out to be dead wrong, because the Israeli population cares actually much more, or large segments of the Israeli population cares much more. Remember, this is a much more communitarian society than the United States. You know, it, this is a society that turned itself in knots over five, for five years over a single hostage, Gilad Shalit, held by, uh, uh, in Gaza. And this is, you know, started as more than 200 hostages. And over time, the salience of the hostage, hostage's fate has loomed much larger for many Israelis, including Israelis who are capable of turning out 100,000 people in the streets, right? This is a big segment of the population, uh, wants to put the hostages' fate ahead of the destruction of Hamas. And that is a very significant political constraint for the Israeli government. So you articulate two goals that are not really consistent with one another, and you operate in an environment in which it is simply impossible to operate effectively without killing a very large number of civilians. And so the result is that you kill a very large number of civilians. Uh, and, you know, the exact number is disputed and the exact ratio of, of civilians to uh, military, uh, legitimate military targets is disputed. Um, but let's just say the number of civilians is lots and the ratio of civilians to non-civilians is high. And whether any individual strike is defensible, whether uh, any accident is forgivable, whether, uh, however you want to frame that, whether the use of 2,000 pound bombs is defensible or not, each of those is a conversation very worth having. But you are talking about a sustained military operation in which you're killing huge numbers of people, in which the civilian death toll is frankly unacceptable, and in which you are not able and willing to provide humanitarian aid access in a fashion that prevents mass starvation. Oh, and by the way, you can't call it off which is what the Biden administration clearly wants with respect to the Rafah operation, because uh, that means giving up on military objective number one. And you can't just get it done and do it now, because that would lead to a real rupture with the United States. And by the way, there are members of your cabinet who actually don't want aid to go in at all and are taking you know, what the Russians might call active measures to frustrate 
the reasonable steps that you might be inclined to take to placate American and world opinion. And so, oh, and by the way, let's just add to it because people forget this. This is a democratic society in which politics matter. You're ferociously unpopular and even your political base has come to hate you. And under indictment. I always want to add that. Let's just never forget that. And you are also under indictment. And by the way, to some degree, we can debate whatever. The whole situation is your fault. <laughs> um, you know, like yeah. you're, you're like whether it's a right. You're the you're the guy who you know is responsible for the security of the country. And the most catastrophic attack on the country came while you were in power. And you were responsible for preventing it. And you've never had the, I'm just going to be really blunt. You've never had the decency to say, I'm responsible. Which, by the way, one of the most popular politicians in Israel right now is Yoav Gallant, the, the defense minister, who is also has a lot to answer for. And why is he popular? He's also said some horrible things about, you know, he's, he's a, like, why is he popular? He's popular because he took responsibility for what happened. And he said, I am the, you know, I was supposed to stop this. Israelis will give you a lot of leeway. Um, and so I, I do want to say that the, the, like, Bibi Netanyahu's position is impossible. And he is playing, he has an extremely bad hand and he's playing it badly. But it's not obvious to me what the right way to play it is. You know, like what, what are the, if, if you replaced Bibi Netanyahu tomorrow with, you know, I don't know, pick your preeminent sense, you know, whoever represents to you ultimate wisdom and said, your job is to salvage this situation or even put that person in power in October 7th, on October 7th, what does the right Israeli strategy look like for that period. That is a totally, you know, and when I first wrote about this after October 7th, that was kind of my puzzle then, and it remains my puzzle now. So yes, I am confused, but I'm confused in exactly the same way I expected to be confused. And I, I really think that might reflect the fact that this is a problem without an approach that works. There's also, I guess, one one sort of addition to that, and Ben, I'm curious how you see this as fitting into the broader kind of dilemma there, is what this is doing to Israel's standing internationally, which has obviously always been a tricky topic. But I have been really struck just in seeing the shift in U.S. political commentary, particularly on cable news for whatever reason. Uh, former Defense Secretary Leon Panetta uh, after the World Central Kitchen strike said that, I don't have the quote directly in front of me right now, but something along the lines of, in my experience, the Israelis tend to shoot first and ask questions later, which is a wild thing for a former U.S. defense secretary to say on television. And there's a really striking interview uh, by Joe Scarborough on, on Morning Joe of a Likud minister who he, where he basically walks the guy into a trap by saying, you know, so, you know, you think Hamas are bad, right? And the guy says, you know, yes, of course, they're, you know, they're terrible, yada, yada, and then says, uh, you know, so why, why were you allowing Qatar to <laughs> give them funding, which is just not something that I ever would have imagined in a million years seeing on like mainstream American cable news. Um, and so that that to me feels like a really big problem as well, in terms of, you know, not only is this a conflict, it's a complete mess. The civilian death toll is horrific and unacceptable. Domestically, you know, if, again, putting on pretending I'm the Israeli government, you're in an impossible position. And internationally, your country's position, which has never been, you know, an easy one to navigate, is in deep, deep, deep trouble. I mean, am I wrong about that? No, you're not wrong about that. And the question again, that you always have to ask with this is, is Israel in deep, deep trouble internationally, or is the current Israeli government in deep, deep trouble internationally? 
And, you know, I don't, I don't think we will know the answer to that question until the Israeli political system in its own spasmodic way gets rid of Bibi, which it will do uh, eventually, um, and replaces him with a government of the center, uh, center right and center left, uh, with some actual left in it. Um, which is what the current polls say would happen. And, you know, the last time this happened, which was two and a half years ago for 18 months, uh, Israel's position internationally improved dramatically, right? Um, and that was with Naftali Bennett, who is a, you know, a quite, you know, arguably to the right of Bibi. Prime but he Minister. looks so great right now. Yeah, well, no, I mean, he... This is Bibi's superpower. He can make anyone else look so good by comparison. No, I, 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 I want to give Naftali Bennett his due, though. Naftali Bennett did visionary things in conjunction with uh, his center-left partner, Yair Lapid, and in in fact with Mansour Abbas, the head of one of the... the uh, Palestinian Israeli parties. I mean, that, there were visionary aspects of that government. And, um, you know, which again shows that the right left distinction in Israeli politics is not always the most salient or most interesting one. And when you replaced Bibi with that government, the international reaction to that was quite striking. In and I think if you imagine a government led by Benny Gantz that had some of a lot of the same figures as uh, was in that government, uh, Israel's international position would improve dramatically. Uh, what would not improve dramatically is their list of options with respect to how to deal with Gaza and. Their, their options with respect to the West Bank would increase, it would improve. But their options with respect to Gaza just suck. And, you know, this is a good, this choice between the hostages and destroying Hamas with Palestinian civilians as kind of the innocent victims of the, of, of choices that they really have very little input into is a, it, that's a larger metaphor for the Israeli set of choices in Gaza and the consequences of those choices. Okay, well, before we close this out, and Ben, since you did mention the West Bank, let's talk about the West Bank briefly here. Um, obviously, with all the focus on Gaza, the West Bank has largely kind of receded. Um, but of course, there's some serious issues there. There's been a lot more violence there in the last few weeks, um, in particular, uh, uh, in response to, uh, I think, a 14-year-old Israeli boy who went missing and I think is presumed dead. A bunch of Israeli settlers basically rioted. Um, some Palestinian towns in the West Bank killed you know, a, a bunch of Palestinians there. Um, the situation seems like it's not escalating even more at the moment. Um, but what, what's your reading on, on how fragile the West Bank situation is? And you know, when you say there are better options under a different administration for dealing with the West Bank, I'm sort of curious what you mean by that and, and why you think that's the case for the West Bank, but, but not for Gaza. Well, the, the reason it's not an option for Gaza is because uh, you don't have the option of removing settlements or controlling settlers because there are no settlers in Gaza. Uh, they were already removed. This was an area where there was actual, you know, if you left it alone, you ended up with major missile attacks on a regular basis. Uh, so in the West Bank, you have levers to pull. And the Israeli government pulls, uh, this Israeli government pulls levers, and they pull all the wrong levers. Uh, they, uh, they increase settlement tenders over the last few weeks and months. Uh, th this settlement uh, settler groups that conduct these, let's just be honest about what they are, they're pogroms, are tolerated and encouraged by ac um, actions of the government. And the government doesn't do what it does. It, the, the government, the Israeli security forces are really good at controlling terrorist organizations when they want to do it. And they choose not to do it in these instances because these people have political protexia, and they are a major component of the government. And so this is, an unlike the Gaza situation, which is arguably insolvable, and, and this is a, a major self-inflicted wound that 
successive Israeli governments have been, in, you know, to different degrees and with different excuses and enthusiasms have been engaged in since the early 1970s. The answer is they could stop doing it. Now, that would require immense political will, but but some of it wouldn't. It would just require not being enthusiastic about the settlement project. And one of those principles is that when settlers go on a rampage and attack Palestinians, you treat that as the criminal justice problem and security problem that it is. And you treat actual violence against Palestinian lives as though it mattered. And that's a choice not to do that. It's not a, you know, and it's a choice for which this government and frankly, a lot of prior governments, but this one is particularly ugly in this respect, need to take responsibility. All right. From criminal justice problems involving mobs in Israel to criminal justice problems involving good. mobs <laughs> in the United States. Man, uh, I, I, really, I really teed that up for you. That's good. <laughs> speaking of violent mobs threatening Spe- democracies. <laughs> right. um, the Supreme Court on Tuesday heard our oral arguments in the grossly undercover case, except on lawfare, of United States v. Fisher. And I want to, uh, I want to say that 98% of what is worth reading in the history of this case has been written on lawfare. 99% of the- dis- <laughs> Yeah, by one person. <laughs> by one person, by Roger Parloff. 99% of the discussions, uh, worth listening to on this subject have been on the lawfare podcast. This case involves a question that is a technical question of statutory interpretation that uh, affects potentially a few hundred January 6th convictions and potentially, depending on how this court rules on it, affects the indictment of Donald Trump on two counts. Uh, so the Supreme Court, according to the press, and I'm, I agree with this a bit, uh, the argument went really badly for the Justice Department and therefore for the uh, cause of accountability for January 6th violence. But, uh, Alan, let's start with what the fuck is this about? And uh, can you give us a little primer on the question in Fisher? Sure. Uh, this, is, this is where I put on my law professor hat you know, had a law professor who teaches statutory interpretation, uh, because this really is just like this like hyper technical question about about statutory language. So this case is about Fisher, one of the January six defendants who was charged with obviously the the attack on the Capitol. And one of the things he was charged with was um, obstructing an official proceeding, the proceeding here being the certification of the, of the Electoral College votes. Now, his district court judge in D.C., Judge Nichols, um, unlike the vast majority of other judges in the district who had approved of these sorts of charges, actually threw the charge out, arguing that the statute uh, at issue did not um, apply to this conduct because it was much more limited. Um, this was then reversed by the D.C. Circuit. Um, Fisher then appealed to the Supreme Court, and that's sort of the procedural posture. So the statute at issue is, uh, for those uh, following along in your hymnals, uh, 18 U.S.C. 1512, part of the Sarbanes-Oxley law that was passed in the wake of the Enron scandal, and specifically uh, subsection C of that law. Now, subsection C has two parts, and it's actually important to understand both of them. So the first part of subsection C, uh, well, subsection C prohibits people who corruptly, and that's the mens rea standard, we'll get to that later because that's actually important. It prohibits people who corruptly do one of two things. The first thing, and this is in sub one, is um, alters, destroys, mutilates, and there are a bunch of other synonyms, an object's integrity or availability for use in official proceedings. So it's basically, you can think of it as evidence tampering, right? Or sometimes called spoliation of evidence. And then there's a subsection two, which is the thing the Fisher was actually charged with, which was otherwise obstructs, influences, or impedes any official proceeding or attempts to do so. And so Fisher's theory is that the otherwise in that phrase means in a way that is similar to the previous section, which is in a way that is similar to destroying evidence. Whereas the government's theory is that the word otherwise is a very broad catch-all provision 
which means, look, you can get in trouble either by destroying evidence. That's one very specific way to get in trouble. But Congress inserted this kind of catch-all subsection 2 provision of anyone who otherwise obstructs, influences, or impedes any official proceeding or attempts to do so. Um, and so that's the, the the kind of statutory, technical statutory interpretation question. And the argument, you know, I thought it was actually quite straightforward, right? Because I think you can read this statute both ways. I tend to find the argument from the three liberal justices that this is meant to be quite broad, especially relative to how broadly the rest of the whole statute is written, reasonably compelling. But just like like thinking about this as, you know, I write leg reg exams for a living and I grade them. Like this would be a thing where I would have to admit, yeah, like there's some clear ambiguity here and you can interpret the word otherwise in, in different ways. And so if you're the liberal justices, you interpret that really broadly. And if you're the conservative justices, you interpret it pretty narrowly. And there is unfortunately this pesky thing in the criminal law called the rule of lenity, which is a general principle that ambiguities in criminal statutes kind of ties go to the defendants. Now, the application of the rule of entity is really complicated because it depends on what counts as an ambiguity. And, you know, you're not supposed to just say any ambiguity counts. It's supposed to be like an ambiguity that's irresolvable by other tools of statutory interpretation. But, you know, the more I think about this, while, while I do think the, the kind of liberals have the better argument, I, I this does not strike me as a self-evidently obvious case. It's interesting that you say that because I I will say after listening to the oral argument and reading up on all of Roger's excellent <laughs> commentary, which I highly recommend to anyone who's interested in this issue. And, and uh, yeah, I, I will admit I I have not I have not I I am not fully uh, familiar with the the entire the Parlof corpus oeuvre. the oeuvre, yeah. Also shout out shout out to Roger for identifying this statute as a potential issue like really early on like. Almost right out of the gate, I think, when when DOJ began charging these cases, if I'm remembering correctly. I So look, I am of two minds on this. I think after listening to our argument, after listening to your points, Alan, like, yes, there is, this is a argument about statutory interpretation, and I guess I could kind of see how it could go both ways. If I take a step back and take off my fake lawyer hat, my reaction is just like, this is why people hate lawyers. Because if you read the statute... <laughs> just wait till you hear about what they think about journalists. <laughs> oh, believe me, I know. Um, you want to see my inbox? The If you just read the statute, it just seems dumb to read otherwise in that narrow way. And like, you can dress that up with all kinds of terms in terms, you know, thinking about statutory interpretation, about why that is like... It just seems silly to read it that way. <laughs> and But wait, but why? Like 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 tell me more. Because of what the word otherwise means. Right? Like it, if if I try to go more into this, we're just going to end up really really deep in the weeds of the oral argument and Quinta I don't is think channeling her inner Elena Kagan. Yeah. Right now. <laughs> I'm honored. Thank you. But look, I don't want to go super deep into like the sentence structure here, um, because that will be interesting to absolutely nobody, especially if you're not looking at the statute. Come up, absolutely not. No, but like it's it says otherwise obstructs. Like, come on. There's at a certain point words mean things, and again, like I understand why this, there is an argument about this. Roger is completely right that like in some ways the statute is historically a weird fit. It makes sense that we would have run into this problem at the same time. A, otherwise means otherwise. And B, it is also noteworthy as Roger has also pointed out in his writing that all of the judges who seem to be sympathetic to this argument for narrowing 1512c2 have been appointed by Republicans. And maybe you could say, oh, well, you know, that means that they're not subject, they're not subject to, you know, the partisan blinders of the January 6th hating liberals who are just slavering for mass incarceration of, you know, the MAGA hordes. But I also think that it seems silly not to note that um, and to note that this came out of a district court decision um, by Judge Nichols, who is a Trump appointee, the two judges in the appeals court decision in Fisher um, who voiced a desire to narrow the statute, although in different ways, it gets complicated, were both Trump appointees. And one is very well respected, Judge Katsis. The other, I would say, is a bit loopy, Judge Walker. 
it's not all Trump appointees, but like that dynamic is there and it feels weird not to note it. I will also say after having listened to oral argument, there was a real undercurrent here in some of the questions from, I, th I think all the justices were trying not to, you know, name the, the man himself, um, Trump. Uh, I will note that according to Politico, Michael Dreben, uh, who is has the hilarious title of counselor to the special counsel um, and will be <laughs> arguing the immunity case in the Supreme Court next week, was sitting in the audience taking notes. But that there was, a, you could tell in these moments that the question of how seriously we should take January 6th kind of poked up through this sort of very dense argument about statutory interpretation. And you saw that in a couple ways. Um, one is, you know, there are all these arguments about oh, well, have you used this statute, you know, to prosecute this kind of crime before? And there was a point, I believe it was Justice Sotomayor basically said like, well, you know, of course you haven't because we haven't seen a violent mob <laughs> attack uh, the Capitol before in, in such and such a way. You know, that's just not something that has happened in the past. And whereas Justice Alito compared January 6th. He did he did begin by saying, you know, I'm not saying I'm not downplaying January 6th. So sorry, Justice Alito. Um, but then, you know, went on to compare it to protesters blocking the Golden Gate Bridge over protesting over the the war in Gaza. And, you know, there are all these kind of implications about how seriously we should take what happened and if it is categorically different in some way. And I do think that that came through in the oral argument in a way that, again, I'm I'm really trying to give good faith here, but it did strike me as kind of disturbing. I have three things to say about this case than this oral argument. The first is that I agree with Quinta that the left-right divide on this case is weird and both at the district court level, where there actually was no left-right divide, there were 14 or 15 judges of diverse party and appointment who all agreed. And then there was Carl Nichols, who was the outlier. But it was very uh, pointed at the D.C. Circuit level, and it was extremely pointed at oral argument, where uh, to one degree or another, Every Republican appointee seemed skeptical to one degree or another of the government's arguments, and every Democratic appointee seemed uh, uh, less so or seemed to, to accept them. So that's, I think it's always gross when the court divides that way on matters that actually don't, shouldn't have political valence. Uh, this isn't an ideological question like, you know, abortion or affirmative action where judges come in with, you know, strong and known views. Uh, this is an issue where uh, uh, how to interpret 1512C uh, is a matter about which nobody's politics uh, obviously bear. And yet you see this division. And I also have a very hard time not understanding that as at some level a reflection on how we feel about the January 6th prosecutions. That said, I want to point out two factors that cut in the other direction. One is that the Supreme Court on a uh, mostly unanimous basis has been on a tear over the last bunch of years narrowing criminal statutes of this type. And it has generally been unanimous um, you know, the McDonald case and, uh, you know, a whole lot of these sort of obstruction and, and, uh, you know, looking skeptically, the leader of this has been the chief justice, but there has not been, there has not been a particular political valence. A lot of these cases of kind of broadly worded statutes that have application in white collar cases, the Supreme Court has been very careful about not letting them be read in overbroad ways. And so in some ways, it is actually the liberals who seem to be defecting from a kind of skepticism about overbroad readings of statutes like this that had been previously a matter of, I, I think, definitely a particular interest of the chiefs. But, uh, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is on all those opinions. And so I'm, I'm not sure whether the explanation here is 
it's certainly clear that the that the Republicans are exhibiting Republican appointees are exhibiting solicitude for Trump. It may be more that the liberals have finally found an overbroad read of a criminal statute that they're comfortable with. I say that as somebody who looks at this statute and says, this clearly covers violently uh, uh, preventing. The the third thing I would say is that um, some of Sam Alito's hypotheticals really stopped me in my tracks. And this is a 20-year felony. And he, I think, made really, there's a wonderful exchange between him and Solicitor General Prelegar uh, in which he's saying, okay, corruptly obstructing a federal proceeding, what about protests who, protesters who yell things in the Supreme Court and we have to slow, stop our proceedings, um, and, or they're blocking the doors. Are we really saying they're guilty of a 20 year felony? And I thought her answers to that, she is a superb oral advocate, just, you know, although she talks too fast, but um, like, it's really hard to keep up with her. I was impressed by how inadequate her answer to that question was. And so I am actually like on the textual reading of the statute. I am completely, I don't think the rule of like, I think the statute is probably should be read the way the 15 judges at the lower court read it, not the way the one did. But I am impressed at how barbaric some applications of that, like if you read it that way, you could have really barbaric applications of this statute. And so I I share the Sam Alito sense that, gosh, it, could this be what it really means? I was struck that of the liberals, the justice who seemed the most open to Fisher's argument and to the argument that the statute is too sweeping was Justice Jackson, who is the only one on the bench with experience as a defense attorney um, and has historically been a little more critical of the government and of prosecutors, which so that kind of feeds into your point, Ben. Well, we'll find out soon enough what the Supreme Court says about this statute, but uh, we're out of time. But it would not be rational security if we did not talk about object lessons. Um, Quinta, let's start with you. I have an update in the Menendez case. Best uh, senator ever. <laughs> not the senator we not the senator we want, but definitely the senator we deserve. I don't even know about that. At least that. New Jerseyans deserve. How dare you? Uh, yes. So you know what? Pump pump your own gas, and then we'll talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. So yes, Man, so I, the- I, I don't usually get Quinta laugh quite that hard. I love it. <laughs> So the update, the update, I will just read you the New York Times headline. It is Senator Menendez charged in bribery scheme may blame his wife. Uh, and that it is that... Uh, Be- behind every successfully corruptive <laughs> se- Senate, right? Senator is... A- <laughs> so yes. So uh, of course, Senator Menendez, his wife Nadine Menendez was also charged in this corruption, alleged corruption scheme. And now per new court filings, it seems like he may be planning to throw her under the bus and argue that it was all her fault. I will just say incredible development. It reminds me of the bit in Arrested Development where one of the characters says that uh, you can't charge a husband and wife for the same crime. Uh, This is excellent. I look forward to seeing how it develops further. Reminds me of the Groucho Marx line, and everything a man does, a woman gets the blame, and your mother is your dog's best friend. (laughs) No, I don't know what it means either. What's your object lesson? So yesterday I saw a movie called War Game. And it has not been released yet. And this movie is a remarkable film that was made by uh, some people in conjunction with the organization Vote Vets. And Vote Vets set up a, a kind of scenario planning exercise in which they invited uh, a whole bunch of former and current, actually, senior officials to play different roles. And the scenario was January 6th replays itself, only this time there are active duty military who have been recruited to disloyalty on the part of the uh, Trump-like candidate. 
Uh, there are a whole bunch of lawfare involved people who took part in this war game. And the cool thing that Vote Vets did was that they invited a filmmaker into the hotel where they were doing it. And they actually had sets that looked like, you know, the situation room. And they gave the filmmakers a uh, license to film the whole thing and produce a film about it. And they did. And it is riveting. And so I recommend it. It is not released yet, but it will be having uh, limited theatrical releases over the next several months. And uh, I encourage everybody to go through it. Um, and for those who are interested in Lawfare Podcast personnel, uh, David Priest uh, took part in the war game. Uh, Alex Vinman uh, was a consultant on the war game. Bill Crystal, uh, our friend from the uh, from the Bulwark, a whole variety of uh, lawfare connected people uh, were involved in this, and it is a uh, really compelling uh, hour and a half of anxiety to watch. Uh, is like is David and are they in the movie? Oh yeah, the oh, the, nice. the filmmakers were just given access to the war game and filmed. Each player, they filmed the entire thing, and then they put together their own cut of the war game, focusing on the themes that they thought were more, most interesting. Amazing. Well, my, uh, my object lesson is also a 90-minute anxiety movie about, you know, insurrection and civil war uh, called Civil War. Uh, this is the new Alex Garland film uh, about a kind of basically present day or slightly in the future America where Nick Offerman, who plays a really good, just a really good, creepy, slightly fascisty president, um, uh, has, you know, gotten to his third term and in the process, Florida and the bunch of Southeastern states have seceded. California and Texas are joined as the good guys, but it's unclear. You know, it's a, it's a really good movie. Um, I'm not going to say too much about it. It's, um, you know, I suspect people who listen to Rational Security are aware of this movie and have at least considered watching it. I mean, I don't suggest it as a date night exactly, but it is a really, it is a good movie. And it's, I will say, um, it's not a pleasant movie to watch. It's quite disturbing, but it's not, um, I thought it was going to be much more sort of like a gory violence fest than it was. It's it's not at all, though obviously it is a violent movie. But uh, yeah, people people should watch it. People should watch it. It's a It's an excellent film. Well, this brings us to the end of this week's episode. Rational Security is, of course, a production of Lawfare, so be sure to visit lawfaremedia.org for our show page with links and past episodes for our written work and the written work of other Lawfare contributors and for information on Lawfare's other podcast series. And be sure to follow us on Twitter or X at R-A-T-L Security, and be sure to leave a rating or a review wherever you might be listening. Also, sign up to become a material supporter of Lawfare on Patreon for an ad-free version of this podcast and other special benefits. Our audio engineer and producer this week was Noam Osmond of Goat Rodeo, and our music, as always, was performed by Sophia Yan. We are once again edited by the wonderful Jen Patya. On behalf of my co-host Quinta and our special guest, Benjamin Wittes, I am Alan Rosenstein, and we will talk to you next week. Until then, goodbye. Goodbye.